Welcome to the HR on the Offensive podcast, brought to you by Lace Partners. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the latest HR on the Offensive podcast. It's me, Chris Howard, from Lace Partners, joining you as always. I hope you are well. Not that you can speak back to me, because this is very much a one-way platform, but uh, people that can speak back to me on the podcast are my co-host today, which is Emily Onis. How are you doing, Emily? right? I'm good, thank you, Chris. Yeah. And uh, we have returning from uh, Bright Horizons UK, it's uh, Jennifer Liston-Smith, who is the Head of Thought Leadership. Jennifer, how are you doing? You all right? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm doing really well. And thank you very much for having me back. Great to be here. Well, it's an interesting conversation because last time, obviously, we talked about your Modern Families Index and some of the research that you've done. And we said we should uh, we should do another one, a follow up one almost, because you've got a UK work and family snapshot. And that's why we wanted to have a little check in and a chat today. But uh, of course, before we do that, we have to drop a fundamentally different question. Before we do that, actually, what we should probably for those people who may not have heard you uh, in your in your wonderful dulcet tones the, uh, the last time that we did the podcast, do you want to give a little bit of a background? on yourself and then also on Bright Horizons. Then we'll get to the fundamentally different question and then we'll talk about the uh, work and family snapshot. Sounds good to me, Chris. Thank you. So as you say, I'm Jennifer Liston-Smith. I head up thought leadership at Bright Horizons. I'm a business psychologist by background. And Bright Horizons, I mean, you might have heard of us in a couple of different ways, either way sort of associated with educational excellence, hopefully. One of the ways that people know the brand is that we have around 300 nurseries, community early learning centres across the UK. But you might also, as you're an HR audience, know us better for our work and family solutions side to the business, where we serve over 420 UK clients and over 1,300 globally. We actually have presence in the UK, the US, Ireland, Australia, the Netherlands, India. And so we're all about helping employers and their employees to make the combination of work and family more successful and smoother to everyone's advantage. We do that through things like on the care front, that's workplace nursery and backup care and in other areas of combining work and family it's around coaching through the parent transition for example digital coaching toolkits online other kinds of coaching and and consultancy and a lot of but that is both online and in person yeah we're going to get into some of the detail around that around the importance of organizations and employers looking at the value that this brings and through productivity and and things like that we're going to talk about the snapshot in a minute but we do have to do the fundamentally different question i will not let you both leave without doing the fundamentally different question just to kick us off today and it's the story that i've just read from a couple of weeks ago actually which was dolce and gabbana have launched a dog perfume and it's named after the founder's pet called fifi so we're going to do uh we so we did a, uh, a pet related one last time, but I'm going to stick with pet related themes. So if Dolce & Gabbana said you can name the perfume for dog or cat in my instance, what would it be? Mine, of course, would be Iago. So uh, I, I think that kind of works as a perfume. Ems, what perfume would you be naming your dog or cat perfume after? Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> A very sort yeah, of my, my dad's British. dog. Charlie, Char, Dolce and <laughs> Charlie by Dolce and Gabbana. And Jennifer, just to round us up, what are we naming? What, what are Dolce and Gabbana naming uh, in your world? Sure. I think Charlie's been done, though, hasn't it, previously? I'm actually going to be a little bit cheeky here because, I mean, you literally have just landed this question on us. But what immediately occurred to me was to call it pet care because, you know, care, fragrance. But pet care, as you'll probably know, is now an aspect of backup care that employers provide to employees. So I thought that was quite clever. It also ties in with something I was reading just this morning, which was that during the summer months, Vogue decided to to have a little sort of pet project, you could say, and they brought out Dogue and apparently celebrities that they've been hunting down to try and get on their front covers who declined were falling over themselves to take part and have their pooches featured on Dogue. So it's <laughs> it's it's happening everywhere. <laughs> yes, indeed. And of course, in the last podcast, we, we were talking about a lot of people think about care and they think about obviously the parents sort of parent mm-hmm. care or child care, but actually pet care is uh, an element too. So if you want to check out that podcast, you 
can, of course, do so. We might put a link to it in the show notes as well, just for those people who fancy listening in some of the conversation we had. But we're here to talk about the UK work and family snapshot. Can you just, I'll kick us off and then maybe Ems, you can uh, fire away. We'll get the first question going in a minute. But uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the actual report itself, like the snapshot itself? So as you said, when we last spoke, we talked about the UK Modern Families Index, which is something Bright Horizons has been doing with a random UK population since 2012. The Work and Family Snapshot is actually a different population that we sample, and that is Bright Horizons clients, employees. So these are all working professionals that work with the organisations that we work for and that we provide services to. So this year we had over 1,800 across just under 200 of our clients. So fairly good representation. So this is a a summary of what they are facing in terms of challenges, what their goals are around combining work and family and, and how they're experiencing our services. There are kind of four, I guess, key headlines probably in the report itself, aren't there, Jennifer? And we'll, we'll explore all of those four if we can in, in the podcast today. We'll see how the kind of conversation goes. But I guess to open it up, the first one talks about family inclusive employers gaining better productivity, performance, and well being in their employees, as well as feeling a strong employer brand. So I guess if you offer your family inclusive policies, it has a very positive impact, is what we're kind of saying there. And, and I wonder kind of whether you see that as trending up, like there's been some increases, are there some interesting differences maybe compared to people who don't have family inclusive policies in place and how big that gap is? It compares really favourably in terms of how employees perceive their employer versus the random UK population. The sort of perception amongst the clients that we serve amongst their employees is way higher than that amongst the random population. For example, when it comes to well-being, which is a good measure of people's actual health as well as how they're feeling about their employer. Those who have access to the services, 61% of them report that it enhances their well-being. When they've used backup care, for example, 82% say that it impacts their well-being. So what the data are telling us is that people are directly reporting an impact of using the services and they report their employer to be way more supportive about family than the the UK population generally. What we found in the Modern Families Index, and you might remember from when we last spoke, it had fallen this year from 77% said in the random population that their employer was supportive of family last year, fell to 72% this year. But in the clients' employees, it's still at 86%, even when they just know about the services being present, and around 92% when they've used backup care. So we can see there's a big differential between those who have access to services like this and those who don't. Yeah, it's really, really interesting that you were saying about that and that kind of need. It's almost there as a comfort blanket that you've got organisations or you've got individuals that know, well, I can use this service, but I don't necessarily need it. I mean, how important do you think that is, that kind of, I know that I can use this service, but I don't have to use it to, in terms of people's well-being? I think it's important, but I also know that using it is the the absolute magic. So I think it helps. And if you know that you have a provision for childcare breaking down on any given day, the nanny's ill or the child mind is on holiday or any other reason like your child's mildly ill, but could be cared for at home by a nanny and you could work in the next room or head off to work. If you know that those situations are covered, should they come up? In some ways, it's going to help the employee think through because it presents Mm -hmm. them with knowing that these things can happen and it may prompt conversations if it's a couple family between the the, the two parents as to what they will do and and who'll be responsible. So it, it can be a kind of really helpful awareness raising, but actually in effect, all across the scores that we've seen, and I mentioned the wellbeing one just a moment ago, we're about 20 plus points, percentage points higher where people have used backup care versus just knowing that it's there. And I should say within those group of employees where we're saying it's awareness of the service, they may well be accessing the online advice for different life stages and things. So they're not getting nothing. They are often accessing a speak to an expert service and things like this to get advice on navigating the care maze for elder care and things like that. So I would say it's quite a bit more than a comfort blanket they are yeah. actually actively accessing information that helps them to to kind of manage life as well 
it's reassuring. I mean, I'm, I'm sure lots of people listening to this podcast will either have their own family, i.e. children, or they might be caring for someone else. And, and just knowing that you've got that support, and I know you use comfort blanket more, Chris, as a provocation of a question versus necessarily yeah. meaning it in that way. But it, it is a reassurance because my husband and I have talked about it. It's like, well, what happens if? You know, we both want to work. It's important to us. And it's part of our who we are actually being able to work and, and all of that but equally family comes first and um, so what do you do when you just have to suddenly step in and support and if you don't have that support at work it's a worry it's adds stress and life is stressful enough so yeah I, I kind of understand that personally on that basis <laughs> and something that you sort of mentioned Jennifer was that the wider employees in, in population feel less supported sorry uh, than they did last year i.e people who who aren't necessarily in your index but the general population feel they don't get as much support from their employers this year as they did in previous years and, and I wonder why that is because later on in the report there's some discussion around over half of um, employees seeing the hours in the office or in the workplace increasing so I don't know if it's linked to that or if there are other underlying factors for example. Yes, I mean, it could be. And right, that was in the wider UK population. And, you know, we saw that generally employers, when we went through the pandemic, did do everything that was possible around well-being. And then there was this sort of bright hope that working from home would become more established, which a lot of people were kind of pinning their expectations to. And then with the return to office mandates with a lot of organisations, you know, wanting to build that kind of culture of being in person. For some, that's felt like a swing of power back to the employer. And I think that might be part of the perception that there's less choice for the individual. But what was really important to us was that sense of being less supported was not borne out across our client population. So we saw the random UK population saying they're less supportive amongst our clients. There was a sustained sense that employers were not only supportive, but more supportive than the random population. And we are working with the world's biggest banks and law firms and tech businesses. These are all the organisations that have been famously in the news for having the return to office mandates, but they are still scoring higher in terms of being perceived to be think it's where they're putting in place the supports and they have whole strategies which they publicize really well internally so the culture is known to be supportive that people are, are not experiencing that same sort of pull back of goodwill i think it's really interesting as well you were just talking about that culture and, and the communication side of it i think is quite important isn't it being able to articulate that we have this offering lots and lots of as you were talking about post pandemic lots of people thinking well this is now the normality that we're just going to get to work from home a little bit more and organizations are thinking well we've got all of this real estate and we also want the collaboration part of it so we need to there's a potential uh, challenge that might come where individuals are saying well look actually i'm more productive when I get to work at home. So if you're able to put mechanisms in place to say, look, we want people back into the office, but we want to put provisions in to support you. And then we're able to communicate that. I think that's really, really important. And that's obviously, we're just touching into the key insight number two that you guys put together, which is care provision keeps work sustainable during care disruption and return to office and life events, which you kind of touched on. What I thought was quite interesting though, and maybe Jennifer, if you can just give us some thoughts on this, was the bit around careers, getting helping people to get their careers back on track. So can you talk to mm -hmm. our, listeners a little bit about that and some of the, the info that you pulled out from the report. Firstly, to the point about care enabling office presence, we saw that for those who had increased their office presence, which was over half the employees in the survey had increased that, they said that they had had to increase their childcare provision to match that. So it is a very real need. And employers who are, for example, providing a workplace nursery or a near site nursery through a partnership, they do find that they're getting really good engagement from employees as well as attendance you know it literally enables people to be there so we found that nearly nine in ten 88 percent said that their employer sponsored early education made it easier to return to work after the birth or adoption of a child so that's another presence at work piece that the actual return which we know can be a, a kind of quite a watershed moment career-wise. And then in terms of continuing to combine work and family, over 17 in 20, so 86%, said that their employer-sponsored childcare made it possible for them to continue working while managing care responsibilities. And another piece that we measure year on year, kind of range of statements that we get people to tick, and one of them is that they would consider their childcare arrangements before accepting a promotion or a new job. 78% would 
consider their childcare before accepting a new job or promotion. So when we're thinking of career development and progression, it's a real factor in that. And, and then if we move away from the sort of ongoing care provision to the back again to the backup care, those days when care falls through, we found that three quarters, 74% said backup care enabled them to work on a day or days that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to. And, you know, that can feel quite disruptive in terms of career. If we have those childcare breakdowns, a lot of us feel very concerned about how does this reflect on me? And we're also really aware of the impact on other team members. So it can be um, impacting other people's careers in a sense, in that the work, if we're taking time off for dependents or annual leave, the work gets distributed. So it, it can be very disruptive all round. And what I think your report touches on, and we talked about this in our last podcast as well, is just the importance of considering all of this as part of the value proposition. Um, obviously, if you promise something, you need to deliver on it. But in particular, that example, Jennifer, that you were citing there around employees considering their childcare options before then saying, well, well yes, I'd accept this promotion or actually I'd consider a new job, i.e. if they didn't feel the childcare provision was good enough in either of those two scenarios, they might actually say no, because that's what's most important to them. So I guess from an attraction side, you're know, thinking about about competitive differentiation, or maybe you might argue actually it, it's not about competitive differentiation, it's just the status quo now is you need to consider all these factors as part of your you know employee value proposition to even start to compete for the best talent. It's just very interesting, I think, for sort of HR directors and getting that mix right because every individual probably wants something slightly different. There might be some consistencies, but everyone's personal circumstance is not the same, is it? So it's it's getting that mix right, I guess, and the choice that maybe we, we offer people as part of that. Yes, you're right, Emma. And, and, you know, over the years, employers have encouraged us to innovate with what backup care means. And it isn't only for the tiniest children. We mentioned pet care earlier. That would appeal to a lot of younger parent or younger people, sorry, who are not yet parents. Interestingly, in the work and family snapshot, we also found that the group who had the biggest reporting of pet care responsibilities was the over 55. So it really does appeal across the age ranges. The other thing that backup care is extended into is virtual tutoring for parents with older children, whether it's the 11 plus exam, whether it's GCSEs and A-levels, actually that's a real kind of peace of mind um, subterna is sort of help with the mental load. But it's also an absence management tool in that if people are working at home sometimes or all the time, there is that often to school period where the kids come back and it can be quite disruptive. If they've got an hour of virtual tutoring, it's enabling the employee to work as well. So I think you're right. It's really had to expand over the years to cover different life stages and adult care as well. A quarter of the people in our survey are caring for an adult in some way. And that's a really important aspect of combining work and family as well. And do you think, you know, bearing all that in mind, that HR directors, you know, HR leadership teams are using data enough to help drive the right insights? Because Chris and I talk about this quite often about the fact that CPOs, the whole people function needs to be more value driven, commercially driven and show the return on investment on some things. You could argue, should you have to do that? But again, someone's always going to ask you to do that. If you're investing in money in something, what's the value of doing it? But do you think businesses are really spending enough time analysing the data around of people that take unpaid leave, for example, because? we haven't offered XYZ. So if we did offer ABC, that might lead to, I don't know, reduced attrition, increased productivity. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess we're fortunate in that we work with really leading employers who are very forward thinking, and they're also the big top performers commercially very often. So I can say that our experience is that the HR teams are very much engaged with this kind of information and doing really well at making those links. we provide data, we provide research pieces like this. We also provide constant reporting to clients about usage and they're really engaged with that. And 100% of our clients in our, our client surveys have said that it reduces absence. So they're very much looking at it in that way. And we will have saved in the last year 110,000 days of what would have been absence for our clients. One of the, the types of organisations that have been really good at making the business case and mapping the return on investment 
management are NHS trusts, which we work with quite a, a few of. And they've really made that link between the, the kind of cost of absence and, and the, the money saved by having people present. They've also looked at the fact that if a key person is absent and an operation doesn't go ahead, there's many, many knock-on effects. So there's a kind of social aspect as well as what you could call a commercial aspect. So my experience is that HR teams are very, very much alert to that. And actually, this kind of service is a particularly appealing one for them because they've got the hard bottom line figures, but they've also got the engagement value and, and parents knocking on the doors saying, I love this, you know, this is brilliant. Do you find that HR teams have to spend more time internally than working on the business and trying to build that business case out for getting this? Like, is that a real challenge that they face, like having these provisions put in place? I think, you know, in the last sort of four or five years, we've seen, you know, it's the usual kind of ebb and flow, isn't it? Things kind of move over time as to what's current. And during the pandemic and in the immediate aftermath, there was less overt focus on the kind of business impact and more overt focus on well-being and obviously talent retention when we had the great resignation. I think it swung a little bit more back towards productivity and performance now, but talent retention stays key. So I think, you know, organisations are, are kind of spreading their focus between the hard metrics around does it enable people to do their job and to, you know, save absence? Yes, it does, because we again, coming back to those figures where I was quoting well-being before, backup care having a huge impact. Equally, four out of five who answered the survey who'd used backup care said it improved the ease of doing their job, their job performance, and it improved their productivity. So that's kind of really juicy metrics in terms of doing the job. But it's also increasing measures like well-being, like engagement, like you know loyalty. So I, I think employers are, are looking across all of those, to be fair. So the, the snapshot, what we'll do is we'll put a link to the actual snapshot in our show notes as well so people can access it. But one of the bits that you say towards the end of the report is you give three kind of pieces of advice before we do that, is there any other bits of data that perhaps we've not touched on? I mean, people can access the report themselves that you think was particularly interesting to call out. And then obviously, second question is, can you just go over those three pieces of advice, which we sort of touched on a little bit, haven't we? Things like the data side of it. And if you put these provisions in place, then people are more productive and it will improve their attendance and it improves their engagement and also the, the employer brand perception as well. Yes. Yeah. I mean, thanks for asking about any other bits. I think it's just well worth having a, a look at the whole report and it's quite brief and readable and, and infographic rich. So it, it's quite a nice piece to look at. I think one of the things that I quite enjoy about it is when we give people a bunch of questions or statements to agree or disagree. One of the things that we see is that people continue to say yes to the statement. I find myself reflecting more on my overall direction and sense of purpose than I used to. So, you know, there is still I think it's something that we saw during the pandemic is still around that kind of sense of what's it all about? What's the meaning of that? That's highest in the over 55s. So that's something we need to consider in terms of talent retention across age groups, but particularly amongst older workers. And the other thing in that same sort of arena is that the 18 to 34 year olds are the highest group in terms of saying my career ambitions are stronger, but they're also the highest group in saying my family's become a higher priority than before. So I would say that the youngest generation in the workplace quite properly wants to have it all, you know, wants to have a, a good career. So it's not about family services, putting people on the, what you might call the mommy track. It's about sort of fueling careers as well, because people want both. And I think that's quite a hard one to manage, that last example in particular, isn't it? Because like, if you want it all, yes, ideally we'd want to offer all of that to you. But what does that, again, really mean? And I think we need to kind of work that through, particularly because someone who's so I'm just over that 34 bracket, I'm not going to say any more than that, but that definitely resonates with me. But that age range of 18 to 34 is big as well. So even within that, there's probably some nuances, which would be fascinating for HR teams, dependent on what industry you're in. You might have quite a high proportion of your workforce that fall in, in that age bracket, actually, 18 to 34. Well, what does that really mean in that context? Are the 18 you know, to 21s want the same thing as the 30 pluses? Yeah, employee resource groups can really help here. You know, networks listening to the voice of employees and asking what support do you need rather than presuming. I think that's really important. Well, we're just about 
on time for the day, unfortunately. So just to recap those uh, those four key insights that we've kind of talked on in different parts, family inclusive employers gain better productivity, performance and well-being as well as a stronger brand. Key insight number two, care provision keeps work sustainable during care disruption. Key insight number three, family supports level the playing field and uh, redress gender imbalances. And then the fourth key insight was uh, different generations look for different family benefits, which we've also just been touching on just there, which I thought was really, really fascinating that bit around that 18 to 34. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, thank you very much for giving us a bit of your time today. As always, it's been amazing to get you on and uh, and talk about some of the interesting uh, stats that we can reflect on from this, uh, this report. Where can people find you if they wanted to have a chat with you guys? So it's, it's Bright Horizons and our website is solutions.brighthorizons.co.uk. And yeah, by all means, get in touch with me. I'm also on LinkedIn, easy to find, Jennifer Liston-Smith. So yeah, please do get in touch. Always happy to, to chat about these things and, and really loved being back with you, Chris and Emma. Thanks so much for having me again. Yeah, it's been great to have you. And Em's as always co-hosting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, if you, you want to find out, if you want to find out a little bit more about any of our podcasts that we do, you can of course go and visit the Lace Partners website, lacepartners.co.uk forward slash podcast. We've also got an insights section which covers videos and webinars and white papers uh, as well as the podcast itself. But from myself, from Jennifer, and from Emma, thank you very much for listening, and hopefully we'll catch you next time on the HR on the Offensive Podcast. Bye bye.